Good morning. We're playing a um, tag team game on this presentation this morning because it's a very, very large project. It has many facets, and we have um, been told <coughs> by Tian to keep it down to just salt marsh. That's it. That will be difficult in some instances, but here we go. We're going to have uh, the project description, um, conservation context and aims presented by myself. Turn over to Jeff <coughs> Sainty, who is going to explain um, his role in planning for the success of this project. Mia Dalby Ball is then from Dragonfly Environmental is then going to tell you how it was actually done. And then I'm going to clean up the uh, tail of the relay with explaining the um, ecological outcomes of this project. So this is, um, in fact, a wetland habitat creation project. It's ambitious, it's unprecedented, it's large. Um, the origin of the project is the expansion of the Brotherson Dock at Port Botany. It's a billion dollar project. Um, the capacity um, is expanded incredibly with about um, almost 2,000 meters of um, additional wharf space. Um, there was 63 hectares of reclaimed land, dedicated road rail access, dredging to create fill, and reclamation of the foreshore um, next to um, foreshore road to create a tug berth. And um, part of the benefit was a new U-Butte boat ramp for boaters. The project had specific aims in terms of environmental outcomes. Primarily, the aim of the project was to increase the quality and the extent <coughs> of feeding and roosting grounds for migratory birds. So yes, it's about salt marsh, but the entire project is all about the birds, providing um, a sustainable habitat for them, providing sustainable food, um, and we also hope to provide some habitat for seagrass to regrow, but that's not salt marsh, so we won't talk about that. <laughs> but here you see um, some Pacific golden plover sticking their heads above um, the salt marsh um, in this created salt marsh, and that is the focus of the talk. The um, <laughs> conservation context, um, uh, to appreciate that, you need to go back um, a few years. Why shorebird habitat? Why is that important? And one of the ways to appreciate that is to look at the shoreline um, of northern Botany Bay. There have been significant changes in hydrology, foreshore alignment, sand habitat, seagrass habitat, and salt marsh habitat through the years. Penryn Estuary itself as a habitat was not created until 1970. It has a pollution legacy, and therefore the expansion of the Port Botany Terminal um, raise concerns about the reduced capacity of Penryn Estuary to support migratory shorebirds, um, which are protected under international agreements such as um, with Japan, Jamba, Kamba, and Rokamba, uh, and they are important uh, commitments from our government, and there was concern that um, the activities of the container terminal could reduce the use of the habitat by shorebirds. So uh, to look at that, change through time very quickly. A few aerial photos that will demonstrate some of these changes um, in the context of that broader shoreline and the um, habitats that have been there in the past. That red circle is around the government wharf in the next few pictures. It is no longer there, uh, but in 1943 it was, and Sydney Airport wasn't developed into Botany Bay at that time as it is now. But key to this photo is a long length of sandy foreshore. You can see dynamic um, hydrology uh, moving sand around, um, particularly into the north and um, west there. Um, and already in 1943, we see some entrainment of that foreshore to the south, um, as well as the interruption by the wharf, etc. And were this another talk, I would tell you about the dark patches of seagrass beds, but I won't. <laughs> um, in 1970, this shot was taken, so the third runway was, or, um, was existed, but they began extending it in 1970. But the key points here is that you see a lot of entrainment already happening along that foreshore. Uh, we still have no sign of Penryn Estuary whatsoever, but we also do notice Botany Park beginning to develop and that 
park and its activities through time are the source of the pollution legacy that um, we needed to deal with in um, Penn and Estuary. By 1979, right button this time, we actually have Penryn Estuary, which was formed, it's an artificial habitat, was formed um, in, the, in the movement of that uh, foreshore area in association with the development of what's called Brotherson Dock now there. The other features you can see is the two, are the two creeks, which basically drain the Botany Industrial Park and feed into Penryn Estuary and hence are the pathway for a lot of the pollution that we see. In 2008, same red circle, by this time um, uh, the government wharf is well and truly derelict and I think it's on a significant government site or something like that. It's still there. However, now we can clearly see the development of um, intertidal vegetation, foreshore dune vegetation within Penryn Estuary itself, and um, further reductions in the length of that beach, foreshore beach, that's foreshore road. Um, and we can also see other things happening there, such as the reduction in the beach width at foreshore beach at various times, which is due to changes in hydrodynamics that have happened as a consequence of various developments. By 2012, which is just before the start, um, sorry, just after the project was, um, was finished, we've got, um, again, changes. We've got reduced natural shoreline. We have a boat ramp. We have bridge access. We have a railway and expanded intertidal sand and salt marsh habitat, which is shown better in this recent picture, recent as in September. So key. Um, points here are bird roost called Big Island here, um, the corner island surrounded by planted salt marsh, the major planted salt marsh area here, and ex much expanded benthic intertidal habitat. Um, so the conservation context of this is that we've had habitat shifts in this environment. Dune has gone to salt marsh, subtidal areas have gone into intertidal sand flats. Uh, mangroves um, were removed, weeds were removed. Um, the habitat creation was specifically for roosting birds. Um, that requires maintenance, including erosion protection, um, mangrove and weed remo removal, as well as activities to maintain the viability of the, those bird populations, such as uh, predator exclusion, um, structures and reducing disturbances that could disturb the birds. So um, this is not a typical like for like um, habitat compensation approach. It's more like pick a winner and the birds are the winner here, um, combined with a field of dreams sort of approach. If you build it, they will come. Um, so in general, um, we think that this is an interesting and unique project. Uh, just briefly, the time frame of it goes way back. Uh, the EIS and initial planning were started in 2001, and the people in, uh, who are presenting today have had um, participation in this project um, almost as long <laughs> as that. So it's a, it's a very big, 15 years is a long time frame for a project, but it's a big one. Key in this, um, in this time frame here are that the plantings happened in December of 2009, massive plantings. The other details are that the um, monitoring for the salt marsh began in 2012 and is ongoing. And at that point, I will turn over to Jeff Sainty to talk about his planning that helped make this project a success. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Peggy. It's nice to be amongst people who actually do some work. <laughs> <laughs> like real work. And uh, my focus is estuary plants and I got caught up in this uh, 10 years ago or more, suddenly moved from freshwater to salt. And all I can say to you is at the start and the finish, if there's any chance to get involved in working with salt marsh or estuaries or whatever, Get into it because it's loaded with variables. You'll never get smart, but you'll have a lot of time. It's a brilliant area to work in. 
And so this book was generated out of um, six months to produce a little um, uh, paperback whatever. Five, five years later, uh, 40 contributors and 20 topics, apart from the plants, uh, it was finished and I wanted to keep going because I could have doubled its size. That's how complex salt marsh is. There's been enormous loss of salt marsh and damage to estuaries, particularly adjacent urbanised places. In fact, they've done them in. I've been involved in a dozen rehab jobs and half of them I'm not proud of and some of them I just don't want to own. So why I'm saying that is never think you've arrived in this game because you've got variables coming at you which go to the top of the tree, not to the bottom of the tree and you think you've got it right but you haven't. Um, I got caught up in the Sydney Ports thing, 2009 was it, through um, various reasons and somehow the biggest driver in this was the realisation that birds win. They are, they're essentially the tail that wagged the dog there. And uh, I've got nothing against that, except that I am troubled at times by how we create habitat for birds, which we wouldn't live in ourselves. <laughs> mangroves out, uh, which is interesting because in many circumstances, mangroves are, are weedy and they knock salt marsh out. And so I'm not against mangroves being out in that situation. But of course they go tall, the birds want vision, and that dominates the plants that you can put in. And that's where Dragonfly and Mia and Andre came on the scene and said, yeah, we can produce plants which are no higher than this. And Phil Straw, who was the guy with the birds, said, I don't want the birds to... I want them to be able to see hundreds of metres in every direction. Uh, and I just wanted to make the point that in this business of putting plants in place, um, mudflats are just as valuable as salt marsh. So if you go into it and you haven't got any money to plant it up, don't fret, leave it a mudflat or let nature um, regenerate itself. Two varieties of spirobolus planted by dragonfly at Penryn. The small one on the left, I think, is minor variety. These aren't species, these are varieties. Uh, just like there's a lot of varieties of humans. <laughs> and the one on the right, the bigger one, is Virginicus. The top photograph on page 173 is Virginicus, Var Virginicus, alongside Var minor. And so when you work in this game of plants, better know what the species is you're talking about. And that's... And in this case, we've gone down to variety. I wanted to also nominate that in here there's a, a section on mosquitoes. And I'm saying if you dabble in this game and you're responsible for creating mosquito habitat, hang on to your hat. <laughs> and with that, I'll finish. Great. <laughs>I'd like to just go through some of the raw mechanics of what to do and why and a little bit of if you miss something out at why it doesn't work so well. So we start with soil and water. Now what my, it may sound really obvious what I'm talking about and you'd all normally do it but in a lot of the projects we work in you can either go as Jeff said you can either just build the habitat and in intertidal areas that can be really good because salt marsh will come back in most areas if you've got some stock. You just need patience and time and you also need it that it's not going to be walked on and trashed while it's growing, so that's a key thing. But if you do have money and you do have a timeline, then planting is the way to do it. And obviously this project had a particular outcome it needed to have, as we heard, uh, small salt marsh plants, like so Sarcocornia was one of the main ones. So nice bush tucker, it's a lot of bush tucker, don't go harvesting it, but you can Buy it in the shops for about $7 for a little packet. Um, so the sarcocornea is a main one out there. Part of the reason is that low growth, so as Peggy was talking about with the birds. So to get the salt marsh to grow, you had to look at what was there. Now the planting spec said it needed to have good soil. So it has a soil which has got some organics in it. This was brought onto the site because as you can see from those aerial photographs, 
it's a highly changed landscape from what it was. You know, the sand had built up. It was largely um, bido, bidu covered sort of dune. It's not really a dune. Bidu covered high out of the intertidal zone. A lot of that was then scraped away, used elsewhere, and we're left with an exposed, pretty raw sand. So yeah, some things may have grown. If you didn't put soil there, I could almost say for sure in the higher zone, you would have had spindly areas with a few plants and the wind just keeps blowing. So that's another thing about this location. If you were to put seed and that sort of thing, she will show that. But the key thing is good soil and water. This was irrigated. So if you didn't irrigate it, I'd say you wouldn't have anywhere near the success rate. Now in this case, it was irrigated with both fresh, but you could also irrigate it with brackish and then irrigate it with salt water. So again, that hardening off time. The middle photo there shows a little patch of white. Now that's where we didn't put the soil conditioner on. This is not a scientific experiment. It's just showing that, hey, look, we've got a little space here. Let's not put some and see what happens. So from a non-scientific, non-replicated, no controls, we just had a look and it looks like maybe it took longer to get cover there. So if anyone wants to do a real experiment, it's a good one. So many experiments have been done with seagrass rack and salt marsh. If you want to look at any of those, G. Chapman and Roberts, Danny Roberts, excellent work. And Jeff was involved in those too. The plants, so here's wonderfully vibrant sarcocornia growing here. The seeds were collected and it was grown from seed. We also had other plants, as Jeff mentioned, the grasses, mostly the, well, we had sporobolus. We didn't really have the other salt marsh grasses. There are a lot of salt marsh grasses. You can, you know, not a lot, three, three or four species. But at least when you go into a salt marsh, you're not working with a particularly diverse plant community in salt marsh. Um, and then in the higher marsh, we had a little bit of the Juncus krausei, but only a little bit again, because as Jeff said, the birds were the main influence. If you're creating a salt marsh, there's at least a suite of six species that are good to put in across that whole salt marsh gradient. The other thing is from another project, things change. So don't think that you know where the low marsh is and the high marsh is when you're planting. Put a little bit of everything everywhere because I know at the H1 site out at Cornell, it all, it all mixed up through time and things changed. And where we put sarcocornia on the really high bank thinking, well, this probably won't last. It's doing the best. And it, yeah, so mix it up. <laughs> Natural regeneration. What we found was where we'd planted, the salt marsh then dropped its seeds. But for it to survive, it needed to have something to hold it, hold it in place. As we said, it's windy. Even just having you know, that nice microclimate climate of the existing plants, there wasn't enough. But we found this bottom middle picture is part of a, a footprint from a gumboot. So we're talking about a couple of you know, three to five millimetres that just gave that little bit of protection and that little bit more moisture, and it lived there well. The picture above that, as you can see, is the irrigation pipe, again, where it grew along that. So if you're doing any of the sort of work in that estuarine area, same we found for mangroves, but I'm not talking about them today, <laughs> um, is that where a seed can wedge somewhere and not be wriggled about by life, and it's moist, it will grow. The other one was in the, the cracking clay, you know, the, it's not clay, it's just the silty particles that you know, came upon the surface. We had good germination there. Also excellent germination where we had rack come up and deposit on things, but because the rack was so light, then once it dried out, all that wonderful growth just died off as well, but went back into carbon. <laughs> Here's a, a close up of that sarcocornia regen in the planted zone. So again, salt marsh projects, sometimes the funds aren't directly available to plant everything. I recommend doing a mix because if you can do a mix, you'll see that you've got space where you get regeneration. Other projects, we don't say that so much because you can get weeds move into the spaces and all that sort of thing. But in salt marsh, your main weed that you're going to get is Juncus acutus. And it's so obvious if you know what you're looking for and no one's supplied it to you as a plant to plant. If you're planting salt marsh, please always check. There are so many jobs we've been supplied with Juncus acutus instead of Juncus krausei. So have a look. If it's blue and slightly pointy, check. So here's a photo of it today. So 
2014. What we're looking at there is we're looking across Sarka Cornea on the top photo. Um, just the patchiness of it. The sand has actually blown up. So this, this does have the good soil underneath, but the sand's blown up and moved in between it through time. We also have a really good regen at the front of it. We do go through there and take out some of the good salt marsh plants, like Suede or Australis, close to the edge because it's too tall. So we are talking about a modified landscape. We've had done other presentations where salt marsh, you can grow the plants, but have we really got the salt marsh ecological functions back? We're looking at that, and the nice thing is it's being looked at. And it often isn't. So you'll see salt marsh projects with plants, but not necessarily seeing, you know, even the big things. When did the crabs come back? I'm pleased to say within two years when we were doing early monitoring, already had crab holes moving into that front bit. So that's really the salt marsh. The plants are in, the plants are growing. You know, as you said, 2009, so it's five years down the track. Come along on that field day that's coming up and see it for yourself. Um, it really, it's a wonderful place because while you're there's times I've been totally lost, you know, looking at a bird or looking at the salt marsh and all, you know, in the background you've got the beep, 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 beep of the cranes. There's the airport, there's the planes going over. But it's amazing what nature can do. And for those of you who work in natural environments, particularly urban ecology, there's something so special about even a small patch, you know, a small patch where the caterpillars live and the butterflies can grow. It makes a difference. And I agree with Jeff. We had hazmat suits on doing some of this work. You know, the, the pollution in Penryn Estuary is major. So I'm not going to comment on what the birds are eating, but I'm going to hand over to, <laughs> to Peggy at that point. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about um, just briefly how we did the monitoring. And um, briefly, because I can see those guys looking at me already just there. Um, the uh, monitoring uh, focused on um, a few areas. There are lots of different ways you can monitor a, um, a habitat creation project like this. We had to pick ones that were repeatable, that were doable, and that were appropriate for the, the area that we were in. So the first one was, of course, mapping the aerial extent, how much salt marsh there is. We then looked at um, the survivorship, the condition of salt marsh plants, diversity. Uh, salt marsh community indicators, and importantly, we compared them to undisturbed habitats within Penryn Estuary. There were some that were untouched through this process largely. Reference areas in Quibre Bay and Woolaware Bay, and constructed, constructed salt marsh habitats. Now, that is a, that's a little bit of an out there punt, but like Jeff said, you know, he's done a lot of reconstruction projects and he's not proud of a lot of them. So picking one that you can compare to as another construction habitat um, is a little bit tricky. I'm not sure that we got that right, but nevertheless, we did that, and some of the results are very interesting. Um, and we also have monitored the plants that were transplanted from one area into another area as part of the whole reconstruction project. Distribution, we, did, we looked at percent cover um, in transects. We looked at um, species diversity in quadrats. We looked at numbers of individual plants. We looked at plant morphology, whether they were good, poor, condition, or dead, with um, criteria there. How tall they were, that was very important for the birds. And the ecological function, which we looked at in terms of diversity and abundance of the epifaunal um, invertebrates that were um, colonizing the area. And lastly, as more of a um, uh, maintenance issue, we looked at the rate at which the environment was being um, invaded by mangroves or not. The yellow is where our basic um, salt marsh area is. The focus has been mostly on that really large rectangular one, a little bit too square angles for my uh, taste, but that's bulldozer driver stuff, I think. Um, and basically, the short story is um, yeah, lots more uh, coverage um, since we've started um, monitoring in 2012. Little tiny decrease there um, in 13 and 14 is really not, if you will, important. It has to do with um, them constructing some um, drains on one side that um, this corner out here and also variation in the front edge, the leading edge of the salt marsh, as well as, um, as, well as mapping error. We walk this area with a DGPS. 
Um, species diversity is very similar to references and that reference um, bar there. Um, and it is not really significantly different. I should say these means are over the past three years that we've been monitoring, so they're not like only the most recent results. The uh, mean number of plants, similarly, percent cover in transects is very similar to reference areas and to other created salt marsh habitats. And in this case, we used um, Scotts Park in San Susie and um, Salt Pan Creek in between the, um, the highway as our constructed reference areas. Similarly and pleasingly, plant height um, is um, coming along very well. Some interesting results there for plant height um, um, by species with respect to some of those constructed wetlands. We have nice epifauna happening. We've got crab holes happening. We've got crabs. We've got snails. We've got amphipods. Um, quite a good variety. Um, periwinkles, um, whelks, mussels, etc. So that is all very good. It, they aren't at the level of the um, abundance that you would like to see yet. They are, however, increasing, steadily increasing from um, that should be 2012 to 14 on those A bars. Then um, lastly, mangrove seedlings. So as part of our monitoring, we look at um, any mangrove seedlings that we see um, taking hold either in the transects in the quadrats and also as part of our mapping exercise. And basically we GPS them and send them to Dragonfly who pull them out. So very, very um, successful project overall, and I have to show you bird pictures because they're the flavor of the day. So plovers, stints, godwits, um, and curlew sandpipers are some of the um, species there. And of course, I knew I wouldn't have time to tell you that the birds are doing rather well and it looks like they have enough to eat. So uh, thank you very much to everybody. It's a large project and a lot of people have helped out, so thank you.